has given glad tidings in 2021 is that word steadfast. And it comes from 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, where Paul told the Corinthian church, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And aren't you thankful that God takes notice of what you do today? You know, our desire here at Glad Tidings is for, is for you to be steadfast and movable in God's work. Our desire is for you to encounter God on, on many different levels. And our goal as a ministry and pastoral team is, is really captured in our vision statement, which is connecting people to God, to one another, to the marketplace, and to the world. And we do this through an emphasis of worship, emphasis on word, and an emphasis on our world. This defines who we are as a ministry. It defines us as a church, and it unifies us around our purpose and goal. G.K. Chesterton said this, we do not want a church that will move with the world. We want a church that will move the world. And how many are looking to be a part of something that influences the world? See, our vision statement is our why. And when you understand your why, your mission, your purpose, it changes and affects your what. I want to show you a few pictures that kind of describe our why. This is Glad Tidings Academy in Haiti. You have 103 students, and you'll notice as they go through the pictures, these are 103 students that you provide their school fees for, that you pay the teachers, and you make sure that these students have a place to go to learn and to get educated, a safe environment, and you give them a meal every day. We started this school two years ago, and today there's 103 students that are thriving because Glad Tidings, this is your why. This is why we do the things that we do. And as your pastor, it's my goal and aim to move you, to move you from the chair to engaging God beyond these four walls engaging God and providing opportunities for you to give and for you to serve and for you to pray. And we have many opportunities before us as a ministry to have great impact in our community, to have great impact in our nation and in our world. Is there a crisis going on? Absolutely. Are there challenges around us? Yes. But there are opportunities before the people of God to be the light and to be the salt. And you and I get the opportunity to be a part of this. So we preach the word so that you and I can be transformed and engaged in authentic worship, which will lead us to influencing the world around us. See, the word of God is what's going to change us. And the word of God should lead us to worship in a very authentic way. And when we're authentic, then we're going to influence those around us. And a wonderful way that we can connect to the world and begin to live out our faith in a practical way is next week in our missions convention. You'll be given the opportunity to make a financial commitment, a faith promise, believing God to help you and to provide the need that we can continue to help people in Haiti. We can continue to minister to our city of refuge in Jamaica, the orphanage that you own and you operate. We can continue to, to minister to the 80 missionaries that we support on a monthly basis. It's, it, we can continue to reach out in our community. You know, we have partnered with an organization called City Serve Florida. 
And we have secured a 5,400 square foot warehouse. And today it is filled with goods that you are helping through City Serve to give out to other ministries, to other churches, so that they can bless people in their community. And glad tidings, you have a seed in everything that goes out. You're literally changing West Orange County. You're influencing uh, these things in a very positive uh, manner. One of our goals here at Glad Tidings is to have 75% of all of our people at any given time involved in missions, involved in missions through giving, serving, and going. And there are so many opportunities for you and I to serve today. That you and I can be a part, that you and I can go, that you and I can do something. And should the Lord tarry, we're leaving a legacy for the next generation. Should the Lord tarry, we're making our mark not only in West Orange County, but in places like in Romania with missionaries Justin and Sarah White. Or Macedonia and with missionaries Tim and Ella Bentley. Or in Cuba with missionaries like Joe Cruz and Damien Zinicola. Or Sri Lanka with missionaries Kyle and Becky Alford. You are making a difference. And glad tidings, it's an honor to be a part of a body of believers who continue to rely upon God and upon the Lord to reach beyond their own potential. It's an honor to be a part of a body of believers who declared, I won't be satisfied with anything ordinary. And church, I don't want to just have ordinary. I want to see something beyond. I want to see something that that goes beyond what we ever thought could happen. And it will as you and I come together. I believe a divine shift of epic proportion is coming to your house, to your home, to your family to our community, and even to your finances. You know, in God's economy, it doesn't make sense that you give 10% plus away. But in God's economy, let me tell you, you can live better on 90% than you can on 100% when you keep it to yourself. See, the world's philosophy is this. The world's economy is think about yourself and take care of yourself and your needs. God's economy is this. Put me first and I'll open the windows of heaven and I'll show you things you've never seen before. And we have lived that. We have experienced that. And God is showing up and doing powerful things. But you know what? Whom God calls, he also resources. He equips And he empowers. We're witnessing what Paul talks about in Corinthians concerning the churches in Macedonia. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, listen to the words of the apostle in verse 3. He says, for I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. They did it out of their own free will. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. They even did more than we had hoped for. Their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and then to us, just as God wanted them to do. Paul said, I can testify that not only did they give what they could afford, but they did far more. Because their first step was this. They gave themselves to the Lord. And if you and I will concentrate on giving ourselves to the Lord, he'll accomplish more through you than you ever dreamed uh, possible. It's important. They gave themselves first to the Lord, then they gave themselves to sound leadership. And when they gave themselves to sound leadership, it says, then God did something wonderful. Now, you'll notice in your notes that you received when you came in, the first thing we're going to talk about is this, God through you. God through you. You know, often the miracle that happens around you will come through you. Often the miracle that will happen around you will come through you. 
Sometimes we're sitting back waiting for it like lightning to strike and this big provision to fall from the sky or somebody to win that $500 million lottery. <laughs> I can't figure out how you win when you don't play. Come on, somebody. Mm, I'm going to have to pray for you, folk. God through you. Go to chapter 2 of 2 Corinthians. Chapter 2, verse 14. Listen to what Paul says. But thank God, he has made us his captives and continues to lead us along in Christ's triumphal procession. Now he uses us to spread the knowledge of Christ everywhere. Like a sweet perfume, our lives are like our Christ-like fragrance rising up to God. Write this. We are his captives. When you settle this in your mind, you are his captives. You realize you belong to him. Your life is his. On another occasion, Paul wrote this. You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your life. See, we've been redeemed with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. He has redeemed us, and now we are his captives. Now we have a different aim. We have a different goal. We have a different purpose. Paul says you're in his parade. Now, I don't know about you, but every parade I've ever been at is a festive thing. It's something that's fun. There's a lot of people laughing and, and just having a good time. Yo, you are in God's parade. You are a testimony to others of what a changed life is. You're a testimony to those around you of what it means to be in the army of God, of what it means to be in the kingdom of God, what it means to belong to him. See, he has taken you as his captive, and now you are in his parade. Good. Write this under C. You have a redefined purpose. He's redefined your purpose. No longer are you living for yourself, but you're living for the kingdom. No longer are you living for yourself, you're living for others. You have a redefined purpose. So as we come together as a church, we discover our redefined purpose. We discover that we're here to have impact. We're discovered that we're here to, to, to do something with our life. And should the Lord tarry, we're here to leave a legacy so that those coming behind us will know the path and they can even do better things than we accomplished. Now, he uses us to spread the knowledge of Christ everywhere like sweet perfume. Your redefined purpose is to spread the knowledge of Christ, how he's redeemed you, how he's changed you, how he's given you purpose, how he's given you a new destiny, how he's given you a purpose in life. What does perfume do? It gets the attention of others. <laughs> I was walking somewhere the other day, and there's a crowd of people. I was coming out, and somebody was walking in, and more when they passed, they had clothed themselves in some perfume that day. <laughs> you took notice. Well, let me tell you the perfume that you're clothed in, the perfume of kindness, love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering. That's the perfume that you have been bathed in, and your life is a fragrance to others pointing to Jesus Christ. Now, we're in this parade, and we are a fragrance rising up to God. Now, that word fragrance is also used in Ephesians 5, verse 2. And in this verse, it's in reference to the sacrifice of Jesus. Paul said, live a life filled with love. Following the example of Christ, he loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. 
So just as the sacrifice of Jesus was a sweet aroma to God, acceptable in his sight, pleasing the Father, so our lives filled with thanksgiving of what God the Father has done is a sweet aroma, pleasing to the Father. And that which pleases the Father brings the favor of the Father. How many know favor ain't fair? And how many know favor will open up doors that you can never open up yourself? How many know that favor can open up doors that your talents and your giftings and your abilities cannot open? How many know that God can bring favor in your life and bring promotion to you? So when your life is a sweet aroma arising to the Father, it brings the favor of God in your life. Be steadfast. Be immovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Which brings us to our second point. Let's talk about God and impact. We spoke about how God wants to use us, that we are his captives in his parade And we have a redefined purpose. Our life is a fragrance, speaking of the goodness of God. So let's talk about God and impact. Go with me for a moment to Romans chapter 4, verse 18. Romans 4, 18 says this. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping. Even when there was no reason for hope, what did Abraham do? He kept hoping. What an example of walking out your faith. Even when there was no physical evidence, even when circumstances seemed to deny the possibility, even when events seemed to prevent, even when the facts of the matter proved to be different, Abraham kept hoping. He kept believing in the promises of God. And I'm talking to somebody here. Even when it doesn't make sense in the world's economy, even when things are not adding up, in your own life, yet you keep believing, you keep trusting, and you keep walking out your faith. You keep doing what you know is right. Abraham kept believing the promises of God. This is what I know about faith. Faith leads to action. Faith requires something of you. Faith requires you to do something. Faith requires you to say more than I believe. Faith requires you to do, to be. Talking about Abraham, let's go back to his calling. So turn with me to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. And we're going to begin reading in verse 1. Genesis 12. Reading out of the New Living Translation. We're going to read down to verse 3. And the Lord had said to Abram, Leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. Leave your native country, that which you are comfortable with, that which you know, you're familiar with. Leave your relatives, that which is sacred to your heart, your father's family, that which is dear to you, that which is your likeness. Leave uh, leave them and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. Notice the emphasis. Do what I've called you to do, and you'll be a blessing to others. Follow me, and you will be a blessing to others. Matter of fact, others will be blessed because of your obedience. 
Did you ever think that others could be blessed because of your activity in your own life? I'm here to tell you that the favor of God will be upon you, but it's not just for you. Your cup will overflow, and there'll be those around you that will be blessed because of your faithfulness. Now listen to what he, what he says He says this, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you. Abraham was a pursuer of God. First and foremost, you and I must be pursuers of God. Most important thing in your life is to pursue God above the familiar, above those you're comfortable with, even those you're like. Be pursuers of God. Don't let those who you're alike hold you back. You pursue God because he's called you. He's redefined your purpose. And he says, I want to favor you. There'll be so many others blessed by your obedience. But you must be a pursuer of God above all things. Let me tell you what I learned about Abraham. Abraham was willing to go further than his father. Further than the previous generation. I think I'm looking at some people who are determined to go further than those before you. You're thankful for the past. You're thankful for your heritage. You're thankful for the pioneers. You're thankful for those who have, who have brushed the way and paved the way for you. But you're determined not to live on their experience. You're determined to go further, to go deeper, to have something even more spectacular in your experience with God than they have. Now, let me explain this. Go to Genesis 11. Go to the final verses of the chapter, verse 31 and verse 32. The concluding verses. One day, Terah took his son, Abram. Terah is Abraham's father. He took his daughter-in-law, Sarah, uh, Abraham's wife, and his grandson, Lot. And he moved away from Ur of the Chaldeans. He was headed for the land of Canaan. He was headed where? To the land of Canaan. But they stopped. They stopped at Haran. Now go back and notice Lot's father. What was his name? Haran. Terah's other son who had died was Haran. So they're headed to the land of Canaan. But when they settled or they came to Haran, there was something that grabbed Terah's affections. There was something that grabbed his attention and he settled because he stopped. Terah lived for 205 years and he died while in Haran. The scriptures seem to indicate Abraham's father had a call to leave his country. He was headed for the land of Canaan. He was headed for what we know, the promised land. He was headed to a place of a new beginning. However, when he got to something that touched him emotionally, he got to something that, 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 that touched him, he stopped. And church, how many of us have stopped and settled in places that God never meant for us to stop and settle. How many times have we stopped and settled for less when God intended to take you to the land of Canaan? God intended to take you to the land of promise. But but because there was something that touched us emotionally, we got tied to that place. And it just simply says this, that Terah lived for 205 years and he never left Haran. Now, I don't know if he stayed in Haran because it represented something to him because his son who had died, his son who had perished, the place was called that. Maybe there was an emotional attachment there. And how many know us parents can get some emotional attachments 
We've got to be honest with ourselves. We've got to be transparent with ourselves. God's got something big for you. God's got something great for you. Let me give you an important note. When you settle down, you quit looking. Your attitude shifts. When you settle down somewhere, you quit looking. And your attitude shifts. You become comfortable. You become, I don't want to move from this place. How many remember the old hymn? I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. You know, a lot of people are still living out that song. <laughs> I'm not going to move. I'm comfortable. I'm not going to move. Hear me. God's got something good for you. Can I ask a very important question? Are you willing to go further than your father? Are you willing to go further than the previous generation? Are you willing to go deeper? Are you willing to step beyond where others have been into the mysteries of God? Or are we settling? My prayer is, Lord, give us a generation who will not stop in Haran, but will who keep walking in obedience till they reach the promised land till they keep and reach all that God has for them. So it's important that I keep moving, I keep going, I keep dreaming, I keep experience. God declared to Abraham, look at verse 1, leave your native country, your relatives, your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. Let me give you an important note. Write this. God has something to show you, but you first have to leave the familiar And follow him to the unknown. It's called faith. (laughs) Did you hear me? It's called faith. Abraham had to leave the familiar, that which was comfortable to him, and he had to be willing to go to the unknown, to follow the Spirit's leading, to follow what he knew God had said to him. It's a journey of faith. It's a journey of trust. It's called the Christian life. The Christian life is about the journey of faith. It's about the journey of trust. Can I tell you four things that faith does? Faith dreams. Faith dreams. Let me tell you a great indication to tell if we have settled and become comfortable. You quit dreaming. You quit dreaming. There are giants for you yet to slay. There are mountains for you yet to climb. There are valleys for you to walk through. There are oceans for you to swim through. There are great adventures for you to attain. Don't think, well, because I'm, I'm so old now or because I'm in this new season of life that, that you just get to settle. God has something great for you. I love the words of Caleb. He says, I'm 80 and five years old now. I remember the promise that God gave me some 45 years ago. Matter of fact, you see that mountain over there? God said, I can have it. So I'm here to claim that promise. Are there anybody here today who's here to claim the promises of God? Say, give me that mountain. And the scripture says there were sons of Anak inhabiting the mountain. You know who they were? They were the giants. But Caleb said, I'm as strong today as I was then. Give it to me. Faith dreams. Faith sees. Faith sees what other people cannot see. Faith sees the potential in a person and is willing to invest in them. Faith faith sees beyond the outside, beyond the circumstance, beyond the current dilemma. And faith says, there's potential in you. Write this, faith moves. Faith is not static. Faith is moving. Faith is an action word. So faith not only dreams, faith not only sees what others do not see, faith moves when others are standing still. Faith does something. Let me tell you what faith does. The fourth thing, faith apprehends. It takes hold of. 
Just like Caleb, give me that mountain. It's mine. Faith apprehends the promise and makes it theirs. Because faith has stepped out into the arena that says, if God doesn't show up, (laughs) it ain't going to happen. But hear me, I believe God's going to show up. I believe God's going to do something. I believe God is going to do something powerful. Let me tell you what God's calling you to, to a deeper relationship. Abraham, his faith led him to go further and deeper than his father ever did. And as a result, Abraham had a different relationship with God than his father did. As a result, Abraham attained things his father never attained. Abraham was known as the friend of God. Fast forward to the book of James, chapter 2, verse 21. So it it happened just as the scriptures say. Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. He believed. There's an action word. How do you know Abraham believed? Because he left the country of his father. He left his relatives. He left the familiar His faith was evident by his action. And it says that God counted him as righteous because he saw his faith. And then it tells us he even was called the friend of God. Abraham developed a relationship with God the Father that he was known as the friend of God. You know, my mom lives up in the panhandle of Florida. I like to go visit her. And one of the things I like to do when I'm visiting her is my father passed away about four years ago. And there's a family cemetery just up the road. You can walk to it from her house. And I love to walk up to the family cemetery because not only to visit my father's tombstone, but to visit his mom, his dad, and their mom and dad. And then another generation before them. And what you notice when you walk through a cemetery or graveyard is there is the, there's the day they were born. There's the day that they passed. And usually there is an epitaph, a, a saying that described the person. A saying that no doubt was a part of their, of their personality, part of what their family thought of that person. You know, if I was to assign an epitaph to Terah, Abraham's father, it would be this. He stopped and he settled. He stopped and he settled. The scriptures assigned the epitaph to Abraham. Abraham, the friend of God. How do you want to be remembered? They stopped. They settled. They lived a comfortable life. Here lies Job. Great man. If your name is Job, there's not a prophecy or anything. I promise. (laughs) The friend of God. Your first priority is to be a pursuer of the Lord. Abraham, an opportunity. Am I going to stay in the land that is comfortable, the land I'm familiar with? Or am I going to walk by faith? And I'm going to take the hand of God and just see what God might do. Others were blessed because Abraham was willing to take the hand of God and just see what God had done. You know the story of Abraham. You know the great miracles that were accomplished. You know the great covenant God made with him. You know the promise that God gave him. And you know that the nations of the earth are blessed because of the faithfulness of Abraham. If the Lord tarries another 100 years, 150 years, you and I will go by the grave. The question is, will the generations to come be blessed because we're known as the friend of God? Or will the epitaph read, they stopped and they settled? Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word today.
And I thank you, God, that we can talk about our heartbeat as a church. We can talk about, God, our vision as a church. We can talk about what matters. And, Lord, we believe that this is the heartbeat of God. We believe missions. We believe, God, connecting people to God, to one another, to the marketplace and world is really what the church is all about. But, God, there's always challenges for us to go a little bit deeper. There's always challenges for us, God, to, to continue to pursue and to step out in faith. And Lord, Genesis 12 tells us that Abraham left and it says he arrived in Canaan. He reached the destination. God, there are some here today that are in a journey and they don't feel like they're ever going to make it. They don't feel like they're ever going to reach that place. But I pray that that life and hope will be breathed into them, that they will know that they're going to reach that destination as they trust God, as they walk in faith. Now, Lord, we want to live with impact. We want to make a difference. We want to leave a legacy. But most of all, we want to be known by our pursuit of God. God, it's so easy for us to stop and settle. And Lord, if there are those of us who have stopped in our journey and we've settled and become comfortable, I pray that we'll be shaken up. God, that today we'll be stirred by the Spirit and we'll continue on this adventurous life with you. As our head is bowed, our eyes are closed. Just a time with you and God. Maybe there's some things in your life. Maybe there's some errors in your life you feel like you just become comfortable with. Maybe metaphorically this idea of the journey. Maybe, maybe in a spiritual sense, you've just kind of settled. You've camped out and you realize God's calling you to a pursuit. Maybe you just need God just to, just to stir some things up in you. If that's you, would you lift your hand and just say, Pastor, will you pray for me? I see that hand. God loves us. I see those hands. I see those hands. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. I wonder if we can stand and just enter into a time of worship enter into a time of just allowing the Lord just to take this message and just speak to our heart today. Will you enter into a time of worship with him?